Hello and welcome to another Atipling Philosopher video with myself, Jonathan M. S. Pierce. It's a quick run through the front line. I always say quick, but weekend stuff's gotten away, so I think it will be quicker today. Um, for the 18th of December 2022. Uh, before we get onto the front lines, overnight news is very limited. Uh, what I will say is that uh, Putin is due to meet uh, Lukashenko, who's a Belarusian leader on the 19th, which is tomorrow in Belarus. And the defence ministers have already met and signed some kind of deal. Um, there's lots of, you know, considerations and lots of people thinking about what's going on in Belarus and whether they are going to get involved in a, in a meaningful way in the in, in the war to send their own troops over the over the northern border, perhaps to for a, a northern offensive in cahoots with the Russians. Uh, Lukashenko has been playing a fairly clever game in doing just enough to keep Russia on side and keep Putin on side. But then, of course, his foreign minister suddenly dropped down dead. He was clearly assassinated by the Russians just after the CTO, CSTO meeting uh, recently in the Eurasian, Caucasian uh, region. And that was a message sent to Belarus to say, look, if, if, you, if you don't start putting your weight and towing the party line, the Russian party line, you will be, you know, knocked off. There's an existential threat to the very people, not just to the nation, but to the people in charge of the nation. So this meeting to take place between Putin and Lukashenko tomorrow could herald a, a new era in this war uh, of working between Belarus and Russia, or Lukashenko could put his foot down and say, you know, no, I'm, I'm not going to get my troops involved. It, they don't want to, the public don't want it, uh, and we could continue as we have been but you wonder what that deal was signed between Shoigu and, and the Belarusian uh, defense minister. Uh, as we look at the figures that the Ukraine produced for the Russian losses yesterday, 590, so an up uptick in, in personnel liquidated, two tanks, five APCs, one artillery system, one drone, and two vehicles or fuel tanks. So pretty low numbers of, of vehicles, but the uptick in, in troops is fairly significant. Obviously, always remember, take those with a pinch of salt. These are the Ukrainian figures. There are no figures that Russia produced for for Ukrainian losses. Uh, some Ukrainian people seem to claim that this figure does not include Wagner personnel and perhaps even DPR and LPR. Uh, but certainly the numbers could be higher, uh, but they also could be very much lower because these are Ukrainian figures and will have uh, some degree of guesstimation and some degree of propaganda involved in that as well. But even if you took that figure as 50%, if you go as low as 50%, there's still 50,000 troops lost, and then you've got the wounded on top of that. So you're talking 150,000 to 200,000 uh, people overall since the beginning of the campaign. Some of those wounded would have gone back into action, but some of those wounded will still be out of out of play. Uh, the only other thing that's really happened overnight, is, and this is 750 kilometers from Kharkiv, this is uh, 1,000 kilometers from Kiev, theoretically within range of Ukraine super drones, if it is from Kharkiv, uh, in, a, in a place called Yelan, which is there. You've got Ukraine here, you've got Kyiv there, you've got Kharkiv somewhere around here, and you have uh, Yelan. There has been some big explosion there. No details that I'm aware of yet, but that makes you think, you know, oops, considering it's the middle of the, middle of the night or certainly in the evening. It makes you think that something is, is, is going on there that's not just some kind of accidental fire, that kind of explosion. That is a big explosion, as you can tell. Uh, so anyway, I'll keep you posted on that. Let's go to the front lines. Uh, we're obviously going to go to the northeast first. I say obviously because that's where I always start. If you have watched me before, Kupians to Svatova to Kremina. Um, usual stuff in terms of repelled attacks all up and down those lines. No reports says Luhansk, uh, Sir, uh, Luhansk sort of head of operations there, Sir, Sir Hai Hadai, says that the Ukrainians are moving towards Svatova. That's interesting. The uh, Ukrainians, uh, this has been generally the idea for the last week or so that they are inching towards Fatima. Um, and I'll show you that on a map in a second. Ukrainians got shelled in Persia, Travnani, uh, and Vilshana. Well, that's fascinating. So, okay, if we go there, let's go to um, the north. Now, I have moved the Ukrainian lines back a little bit from Vilshana and Persia, Travnani. So, this is the area just north, uh, northeast, I guess, of Kupiansk. Uh, Kupiansk is down here, 
um, and you've got Svatova further down south there. So Pusha, Travnevi and Vilshana, the Russians appear to be in control of them at the moment. I push the Ukrainian lines back. There's been talk about, you know, fighting going on now around Tavuljanka, Horobivka, Dorichna, uh, which are now under Russian control. So they Russians have made some advances around here. Yet, if the Russians are shelling Vilshana and Pusha, Travnevi, that means the Ukrainians are in those uh, towns. So it's uh, I, I'm not 100% sure yet exactly what's going on there. Um, Russian sources confirmed that Ukrainians have attacked near uh, Sofivka. Uh, this is plausible since uh, Volodymyrivka um, was shelled multiple times this week. So this is coming further down here. Sofivka is here uh, and Volodymyrivka is there. So if Mar Volodymyrivka, as no report says, uh, was shelled multiple times this week. And the the, the uh, inference there, or the implication, sorry, there, is that, that the Russians were shelling that, then there could be Ukrainian presence there. And if that's the case, if they have taken Volodymyrivka, then they could be moving on towards Sovivka, um and and so on and so forth. So it, some movement possibly uh, just northwest of Svatova, uh, the usual stuff around Svatova, as in, you know, these towns around here, we don't hear an awful lot of. Uh, until we get down to um, Kuzumivka. Uh, but, oh, sorry, get up. That's Kuzumivka, sorry, northwest of uh, Svatova there. Uh, Novoselivsk, I'll show you some footage of the absolute devastation in that settlement um, uh, that, that's taken place. Uh, and Kolomo Ichika as well, um, fighting has been pretty fierce around there over the last uh, few weeks. Now, as we look from Svatva to Kremena, there is this highway, the P66 highway. Apparently, the Ukrainians once again have actually got purchase on this highway, some sources say, uh, down further near Chavona Papivka and have fire control over the highway up further towards Svatva. But however, you know, if the lines haven't changed that much, it's, it's, you wonder how that's possible. So there could be some change in lines. It's just, you know, quite difficult to work out exactly what's going on. There are various sources saying various things. Russian sources, War Gunzo, have confirmed that Ukrainians are attacking near Holokova, and this would mean Chavona Papivka is under control, since an attack on Holokova would be suicide without controlling the flanks. We change the area of, of control north of Chivapon Papivka in favour of Ukraine. Now, if that's the case, then this is certainly where they've got... Um, they've crossed the P66 highway. So it could well be, and, and you know, this would be, I'm not going to, you know, do this for sure, but it could well be that uh, you have the Ukrainians across the highway around here, um, and they have at least some control over Chavona Pipivka, and this this would then uh, ratify the the claims that were made that, that, that they have crossed the P66 uh, down further near Kremina. Um, and then... As, as well, they are apparently repelling atta Russian attacks near Ploschanka, towards, towards Ploschanka and Chavona Papivka, but also um, that they are attacking, Ukrainians themselves are attacking uh, the Russian positions near Nevska. Well, that's further inland here and near Terny. So we was talking last this last week about how the Russians are sort of pushing down here towards um, Liman, really, or on, on this front where there's been a big grey zone for some time. So there's, again, confusion. At, uh, attacks, uh, you know, north and south of certain places and so you just imagine this zigzag again where it's just not one contiguous uh, you know straight line uh down north to south but actually attacks from both sides going on uh, essentially all over the shop um so that that's uh that's what's going on there as we come further down south sort of uh of um Kremina now and also, as per normal, uh, there have been HIMARS or, or long-range strikes east of Svatova, east of uh, the front line in general. So Ukrainian forces reportedly continue to strike Russian rear areas in Luhansk or Blask. Um, uh, they claim that Ukrainian forces struck Russian rears near Lantraviv. Uh, Trativka, which is 57 kilometers northeast uh, of Svatova, and Shatia, which is 78 kilometers southeast of Kremina, and Kadivka again. So uh, there, those are, you know, the usual sort of high Mars activities around and about, but a couple of new, new places. 
And just to let you know where Lantritivka is, that's actually right next to the uh, Russian border, up sort of northeast of Persia, Travnevi, Vilshana, and Tavolzhanko. Uh, so, you know, that's somewhere that we haven't haven't heard mentioned before uh, near Troitsky. Okay, and uh, further down there was uh, Kadivka attacked. Uh, as well, and Shastia, which is just there north of Luhansk city. So those three seem to have uh, had some attention, obviously some kind of ammo depots or, or command and control places or what have you, not exactly sure. So as we come down Bilirivka, I mean, there, there's obviously fighting still in the forest, slightly unclear of exactly what's happening here. Um, no news uh, on from yesterday where I was talking about how Ukrainians claimed they're 1.5 kilometers from Dubrova, uh, and other such things, whereas previously they, they claimed that they were in control of Dubrovka, so it's difficult to know exactly what's going on in the forested area. Attacks towards um, this town of Hirovivka. Don't know much more about that. I do know that Bilirivka is very much contested, that the Ukrainians are in the western side of the town, or, obviously, uh, but, you know, hanging on in there. So I think that is quite tough fighting in Bilirivka at the moment. And that is a really important place if they want to do anything towards Kremna. Uh, and and hold this sort of front line going down to sort of Spirine. Bilirivka needs to hold out. Um, and, and that incursion from the Russians just behind them is not good news. Uh, so this could be a troublesome sort of area to look out for over the next week. Uh, and then really we come down to Yakolivka. Yakolivka apparently pretty much now under Russian control. You know, whatever elements of, of uh, Ukrainian forces that might be in Yakolivka, it'll only be the very much the outskirts. I think that that is, that is definitely in their control. And that means Solidar is uh, now uh, ripe for being flanked. And that is exactly what the Ukrainians, uh, the Russians would want. It allows them to really get behind the Ukrainians here, either up to Vesely and sort of help go north. They could pour in forces to do that at the same time as pouring in forces, uh, pouring in forces, sorry, to flank uh, Solidar and then get a hold over the north of Bakhmut. So that is that is certainly a challenge. So the ISW reports some fairly interesting stuff here. Geolocated footage shows Ukrainian troops shelling Russian positions northeast of Bakhmut between Solodar and Bakhmutska, indicating Russian forces have advanced in the area. So that would be quite troubling because that means that that here there is shelling taking place, uh, geolocated shelling is taking place in areas that were previously Ukrainian. So that could be a worry. But then also Russian uh, sources are saying that they repelled uh, Ukrainian counterattacks both both sort of northeast uh, and southwest of Bakhmut. So it, it seems like the Ukrainians are trying to, to regain lost territory as well, although they were repelled. Uh, this is very much of interest, which is a Ukrainian volunteer serviceman reported that Wagner Group forces in Opitni are being reinforced either by fresh Wagner Group troops or conventional Russian servicemen, potentially marine detachments from the Vukhladar area. This is something I talked about yesterday, which is there's now evidence that this isn't just the Wagner mercenaries. And in fact, in the e uh, eastern areas of Bakhmut city, the suburbs, it appears that they are conventional or Donetsk militia uh, uh, troops working there. So that is um, that is a concern if Russia are, are punning on all sorts of punning in all sorts of different resources. Russian military blogger reported that small arms exchanges are ongoing in Opitni and Ukrainian troops are actively counterattacking south of Bakhmut near Kurdimivka and Ozaryanivka. The Russian Ministry of Defense claimed that Russian forces repelled Ukrainian counterattacks in northeast and southeast and south of Bakhmut. Multiple Russian sources circulated footage of Ukrainian trenches in Bakhmut city center, suggesting that this indicates Ukrainian troops are preparing for urban combat defense. Well, you would absolutely expect that. Of course, they're going to have um, contingency plans. Uh, so before I go south uh, and talk about Opitni and um uh and Kurdi Mifka and Ozer Ivka just to let you know what no report says um so heavy artillery arrived from the front so this could be the high Mars that he's referring to here that I talked about yes I showed you some video footage of high Mars working in the area or GMLR systems Yakolivka Russia controls it and is considered lost solidized now uh, has to watch out to being out for being outflanked. Russian sources claim successes more south near Kodiamivka, but we have seen zero evidence of this grain assault. And I would actually, disagree, yeah, I'd agree that that is that is incorrect because it seems that Ukrainians have pushed back a little there. And I'll show you in a second. 
Ukrainians have pushed the Wagner PMC back three blocks uh, the, from the three blocks they controlled east of Bakhmut to Makismienka Street uh, and Vatutina Lane. The white dashed area in the second image are regained territory, and I'll show you that in a second. The Russian forces also retreated from the garbage dump southeast of Bakhmut, which I showed you yesterday. So the, this is the air, this is a garbage dump that they've taken back, and it seems that there's regained territory along this road and indeed here. So it could be that effective the Russians are pushed back. I'm not going to show it on my map yet officially. I just I like to wait a little bit. Um, but it could be that the Russians actually push back basically to this, this first road going north to south. Um, and perhaps, so here he talked about this road as well. So in fact, you know, let, let's, let's just do a bit of live editing just to show you you know the, the the this but remember this is ukrainian sources um but it seems like quite a few ukrainian sources are saying this so they could well only have that kind of area now i'm not sure about this sort of field area it's called the rest of it gray zone um and this is super important because uh the well it's super important because obviously the, the ukrainians need to hold Bakhmut. But what is important here is the garbage dump, as I said yesterday, because it gives you, you know, visuals over that suburban area to the north there. And as I think a really important tactical position for the Ukrainians or the Russians to take. So when the Russians took that, that worried me. And then it was in, in concert with what they did up up here in these suburbs. So the fact that Ukraine have taken that back is, I think, is possibly enabling you know success further further along that that road. But it'd be interesting to see what's going on south of that and in this kind of flat area here. You get quite good visuals from there, right across this flat land. And any kind of Russian forces trying to traverse this are in open sort of area to be hit by artillery and mortars and whatnot. Up it near a lot of fighting reinforcements. Apparently, uh, according to that Ukrainian service, and saying that it could be regular Russian forces fighting in Opitny. Uh, Chris Schiffer again, you know, various claims either way. But it, I think it seems to me that the, the Ukrainians are hitting back around here. So I talked to you uh, about this, and I've reflected it already myself. But some other bloggers are doing uh, military bloggers, and and sorry, not not so much bloggers, um, mappers are doing it themselves. I talked to you about this area of Ozaryanivka, um, which is, so uh, that's down to my also Ozaryanivka here, uh, that you had this sort of trench area um, that I, I showed you the, the video footage of that getting absolutely hammered by airburst shells. So I, actually, that, let's change it because I haven't actually fully changed it. Um, it appears, so some mappers, Defmon, for example, is pretty confident that, that they're pushed back to the canal basically now. Um, so we shall see. That makes sense to me because there was pretty much absolute destruction there. And I'd imagine once you've done that, then Ukrainians would want to kind of come and claim that territory for themselves. But of course, then they're going to be um, ripe for artillery fire and mortar fire from the Russians. So, you know, it's like some sometimes these areas are like poison chalices. Anyway, let's move move further on south. Uh, that's all. It's all happening all over Bakhmut. But I, I'd say slightly better news east and south of Bakhmut for the Ukrainians, but worse news north uh, because Yakolivka appears to be pretty much um, under Russian con control. Uh, let's move down to Avdivka now. So we have the uh, usual claims of repelled attacks all, all around sort of Abdivka. The Russians have been putting pressure on around Vodjani, um, Pervomaisky through Pisky and Novelsky, which is this tiny little uh, settlement around here with lots of entrenchments around it. I haven't changed my maps at all, but just repelled attacks all around there. Now, uh, from between here and Krasnohorivka, and in fact, Marienka, so there's lots of news. It seems like... Uh, Marienka seems to be far the far more attention seems to be on Marienka actually now than Avdivka just at the moment. Uh, but there's quite a lot of activity going on between Povomysky here and and uh, Marienka down there, including Krasnoharivka. So Andrew Perpetua has saying uh, that I created this image. The light arrows show where the Russian is currently attacking. The dark arrows show. Oops, uh, I need to finish reading that. Um, uh, the dark arrows show their plans. The blue dotted lines depict Ukrainian strongholds. Um, so uh, 
if you look here, so just to let you know, Pervomysky, Pisky, this is Abdivka up here, Borjani and Novelsky, where I was just telling you about there, they are attacking in Novelsky, they're attacking in, in Pervomysky or th through Pisky to Pervomysky, but with the plans to go on further to Karlivka back here, uh, and we've heard, you know, attacks towards there uh, over the last couple of days, and Krasna Harivka. So if they can get Novelsky, so Novelsky is holding out. Uh, and it's really useful because if they lose Novelsky Ukraine, it allows Krasnohirovka to be flanked. So that's how important that tiny little settlement really is. And then we come back uh, down further to the south to Marinka. So Marinka is, as you can see, being attacked all over the shop. And there's quite a lot of fighting going on near Pobieda, just to the southwest of uh, Marinka as well. The the plans would be to just continue through uh, to Ka, um, Kurokhova. Uh, through other settlements again obviously they want everything right but this would allow if Marienka falls and Pobieda falls it would allow a flanking further north which would then mean that places like Vukhladar and, and everything further down south of there would, would easily be taken out because the, the Russians would be in behind them so that's that's your intentions but the Ukrainians do have some really big strongholds here. Like none of these places would be easy to take. Povomysky is not easy to take, as we've seen, even though it is now effectively flattened. Um, but there's there's enough sort of uh, buildings and natural landmarks like rivers uh, and water water features to uh, keep the Russians attack quite difficult uh, to obtain success there but so you know they're channeled they're sort of funneled through this area and it just becomes a shooting alley uh, the the same can possibly be said further down south where you have an, a, a lot of other water features and uh, as i say ukrainian strongholds so that's quite interesting there and um you know, as Andrew Perpetua says, behind Marienka, there's a town of Hirovka. Uh, I'm sure Ukraine will defend this town to some degree, but the town behind it, uh, Maximilianivka, uh, is where I believe Ukraine will make the strongest defense. Both of these are long, narrow towns that run parallel to two main roads, just like Pervomysky. So Pervomysky has been so difficult. It's this long, narrow town that, uh, that has proved so difficult. So while Ukraine still holds their defences in Marienka and could for a while longer, realistically, Russia will eventually capture the ruins of the city. When Russia attacked Bakhmut, Marienka was shelled. When Ukraine liberated Kharkiv, Marienka was shelled. When Ukraine liberated Kherson, Marienka was shelled. Marienka getting shelled is the one constant in this war. Uh, Marienka is demolished. Uh, Marienka has been totally destroyed. He continues saying every building is destroyed from months of shelling. Think of it this way. When Russia was assaulting Kiev, Marienka was shelled. Uh, when Russia again was attacking Mariupol, it was shelled. Sarodonetsk, Marienka was shelled. So on and so forth. It is uh, just a, a bit of a, a, a terrible situation there at the moment. Um, and the ISW pretty much, uh, you know, agrees with that. Um Synopsis whilst also saying uh, areas like Nova Mokolivka is, is under quite a lot of uh, pressure as well. They seem to have pulled out from attacking Pavlivka and these areas down here, the Russians. So maybe that is true that they've sent some of their, their troops that are working down here up to the Bakhmut to help with the, the Wagner PMC. Apparently, uh, and I already reported this yesterday, that um, Russians claim they destroyed a reconnaissance, a Ukrainian reconnaissance group in uh, Nova Milyoski and Shevchenko, which uh, the ISW are reporting today. So, you know, head of the game, I guess. Uh, um, here, we, Russian troops destroyed two sabotage. This is called to, to Russian MD, of course. Uh, destroyed two Ukrainian sabotage and reconnaissance groups near Novomorsky and Shevchenko. Uh, so there you go. That's what's happening there. Usual sort of um, artillery fire along the line of Zaporizhia, uh, and then we get into. Um, uh, Kherson, again, same old, same old. It's not really much going on, in fact, to the point where one of my one of my sources, uh, Noel Reports, is no longer going to be reporting on uh, doing sit reps of Kherson because basically nothing really happens. And actually, he's going to start doing sit reps along the Zaporizhia front instead. But uh, a few things, you know, Ukrainian officials warn that Russian forces may be attempting to draw Ukrainian forces into a trap on the east bank of the Dnipro River. So I talked to you about how they're apparently taking out um, uh, administration officials and some sort of, uh, you know, collaborators and some troops from Kokovka and Novokokovka. And by by saying they're doing that, of course, are they inviting the Ukrainians to think, oh, this is a good time to attack and then leading them to, to uh, a trap? Well, that could be the, what is happening according to the ISW. Um, 
So there you go. Uh, Russian forces have been telling locals that they will fully withdraw from Kokovka area by the new year. Again, you know, is that a trap? Uh, Southern Operational Command spokesperson uh, Natalia Hemenyuk stated that Ukrainian officials are verifying this information because Russian forces could be attempting to lure Ukrainian forces into a trap. Um, it is very unlikely that Russian forces would be able to fake a withdrawal without Ukrainian forces detecting the deception. I mean, they've got such good intelligence, such good satellite imagery of, of everywhere that it would be pretty unlikely uh, that they would be hoodwinked by the Russians here. Uh, Ukrainian forces continue to strike Russian rear areas in southern Ukraine. Ukrainian general staff reported that they struck concentrations in Tokhmak, Polohi and wounded over 100 Russian military personnel and destroyed an ammunition depot. Um, a Ukrainian source reported explosions in the Zalizhny port. Uh, I don't know if that's a separate one to the one uh, that I'd already reported. I think it is because this seems like a day later. This seems only yesterday, um, but it might not be. It might be the one I reported yesterday. Um, and Russian forces continue to do uh, missile strikes and rocket strikes uh, on the Ukrainians. So same old, same old. Anyway, that is uh, a bit of a rush through the front lines for you. Um, hope hope that was useful for you. Uh, again, it's all about Bakhmut, but no real, as uh, Warmapper says here, no confirmed changes to Bakhmut particularly. Uh, at least not to this central area. I would say that uh, that actually there's a slight change that the Russians have been pushed back on the east. Um, but again, watch out for Yakolivka up or, uh, in the northeast there because that is a worry. Um, thank you so much for your support. I might not be able to do an extra today, but on my um, Atempling Philosopher channel, I will be uh, producing a video which I've recorded about Elon Musk because I was challenged quite a lot on Elon Musk on one of my videos it, as pertains to Ukraine, but also in, pertaining to freedom of speech and Twitter because I use Twitter a lot and it's really important as a, as a source of open source intelligence. Um, and so I've done a video to kind of answer my critics on him. Please check that out. That should go out later if I get a time to upload that, probably when I get back from uh, a bit of Christmas uh, shenanigans today uh, on Sunday. Anyway, Thank you so much. You take care. Uh, please like, subscribe, share, and all the ways you can support my channel. Thank you so much to people who who are supporting through Buy Me A Coffee. I've had so many generous people helping out there. A massive thanks, for example, to Gary, William, Ian, you, you know who you are, um, Cyprian, Neil, Gary again, Jan, David, uh, Jake, just really, really kind people who are supporting my efforts here and allow me to continue doing this. Anyway, that's enough. See you later. Merry Christmas.